Everywhere you look, you see people itching for a fight. People are drawing lines, heating up the rhetoric. And you wonder where it's all going to end. It makes you think of that image the Buddha talked about, his vision of the world before he left the palace. He says it was like seeing fish in a little tiny stream struggling, fighting one another over what little water they had. The stream was dwindling. Of course, they're all going to die. And everywhere he looked, something, everything was laid claim to, as he said. If you wanted anything, you had to fight somebody for it. He was overcome with what he said was a sense of sangwega, which can be translated as dismay, or even stronger terms as terror. This is what the world is like. You fight and fight, and then you die. And you come back and you fight some more. He said he looked for a way out, and then he learned to look into his own heart, and he saw that there was an arrow embedded in his heart. When he removed the arrow, that was the end of the problem. So what is this arrow that causes us to want to fight? Well, it comes down to the things we identify with, and we identify with them out of greed, aversion, and delusion. This is a type of thinking the Buddha calls babancha. You start with the idea, well, this is me, this is who I am, and then you decide, well, these are the things I need, and you start laying claim. And that, he says, is the beginning of conflict. So you have to turn and look at these perceptions about who you are, and particularly with the greed, aversion, and delusion that stoke that sense of who you are, because they're the real problem. I was reading a while back someone saying that our problem is that we have the wrong map of reality. We think that there is a permanent self, and so when things happen to us, we react as if there were a permanent self. But once we realize there is no permanent self, then there's no reaction and everybody's okay. That's like saying, realizing that my food is impermanent, my stomach is impermanent, so I'm just not going to eat anymore. As long as there's hunger, there's going to be eating. As long as there's greed, aversion, delusion, there's going to be a sense of self that you've got to defend. Of course, there's a hunger. And the Buddha's not saying, don't be hungry. He says, find a state of mind that doesn't require hunger. That's what we're looking for inside. So the fight is not outside, the fight is inside, or the good fight is inside. Trying to figure out why you are overcome by greed or aversion or delusion. What you good can do to fight it off. In the first line of the strategy is to be virtuous, to have principles, to have character. In other words, to be the kind of person you can trust, that you're not going to harm anybody, you're not going to harm yourself, you're not going to harm other people. Because this gives you a sense of the importance of your actions. And when you have that principle of harmlessness, then you turn it inside. Say, how can I be truly harmful? Because as you go through the world, you notice even observing the precepts, The fact that you're alive places a weight on the world. The fact that you're a human being, or a being of any kind. You need food, you need clothing, you need shelter, you need medicine. As human beings, we need to gather these things. But is there a potential in the mind where we don't need these things? So even if you eat a vegetarian diet and try to be as gentle as possible on the earth. It's still a burden that you place on others. The highest happiness, the best happiness, would be one where there's no burden on anybody. So taking the precepts sensitizes you to the fact that you've got to do better than just the precepts. This is why we come to meditation, to figure out what it is in the mind that makes us want to lay claim to things that then we have to fight over. 
So the first line of business is to get the mind in a state where it sees what's going on, and it has a sense of being nourished as it looks, looks at things, examines things. It's like being a scientist. You want to understand monkeys, so you get a huge supply of bananas to feed the monkeys. But then if the scientists are hungry, not all the bananas are going to get to the monkeys. So you've got to feed the scientists well. So the mind has to be fed. This is why we try to create a sense of well-being through the concentration. We're taming our hunger, sensitizing ourselves to a higher aspiration than just to go around feeding off things outside. You can feed the mind with pleasure. You can feed the mind with rapture. It's simply sitting here breathing. You can get a sense of fullness or well-being. If you're very attentive to how the breathing works, you can figure out a way to breathe that feels really solid and nourishing. And you realize you've got a sense of well-being you can tap into at any time. And so a lot of the hunger to take more than you really need from the earth, or more than you really need from the people around you, that gets assuaged. It weakens. It's milder. It's still there, but it's not as strong as it once was. And then you can dig deeper into the mind to see what's going on, why the mind keeps creating trouble for itself. Then you realize part of it, you learn from dealing with the distractions to your concentration. You begin to see this is how the mind creates a thought. This is how it creates an identity. This is how it creates a world of becoming, as they say. In other words, that desire arises in the mind, and then you create a world around that desire. The world is made up of the things that will help you gain what you want, but you also find that parts of those worlds have things that get in the way of what you want. As for things that are irrelevant to the desire, those, are, those fall into the background of that particular world. But if a different desire comes up, you might create another world, and then the things that were in the background of the previous world now suddenly come to the foreground, depending on the new desire. And you can see this as it happens, as you meditate. You're sitting here, and all of a sudden you find yourself someplace else. But you come back, and then you're someplace else again. You've got to learn how to see those steps. How do you go to that other place? The mind likes to hide these steps from itself, like people who put on a play. Between the scenes, they have the curtain go down so that the people on the stage can, or the stagehands can move the scenery around. If the audience watched the scenery being, being moved around, it would destroy part of the illusion. So the curtain goes down, they change the scenery, then the curtain comes up, and you're in a new place. What is this act of the mind that drops the curtain? It's almost like it's in collusion with itself to deceive itself. Can you see through those steps? And you'll find as you make up your mind that you're going to avoid any distraction from the meditation, you get more and more sensitive to the steps. So this is how the mind creates this new world. And if you see that it's going to be an unskillful world, you can nip it in the bud. That skill is useful in all kinds of areas of life. When you're sick, you find the mind dwelling on things that make you miserable. Well, you can say, I don't need to go with those thoughts. No matter how true they may be, they're not useful right now. They're not beneficial. This is not the time and place for them. And you have a better place to go. You can work on figuring out which parts of the body can be made comfortable, so you can gain some nourishment there. And then watch out for the mind's tendency to go off and think in ways that are going to be harmful. The other way you learn about the process of becoming is watching the state of concentration itself. You can do this in two ways. One, in just being in a state of concentration, then pulling back a little bit from it, noticing what's going on. How do I keep this concentration going? You want to do this only after you've well settled in the concentration. 
then it becomes easy for you to stay. If you do it too early, you tend to destroy it before it's gotten there solidly enough. But it is possible, once the mind really is well implanted in its object, that it can pull back a little bit and then notice what's going on here. How did the mind create this world? Because when you're creating the world, it's not just the world, there's also a sense of identity. There's who you are in that world related to that particular desire. And you can see this process. Some worlds are actually worth creating, others are not. And you learn to get very discerning. You develop a sense of good sense of judgment as you fight off the worlds that are not conducive to you and maintain the worlds that are. You get a better and better sense of how the mind is creating these desires. and the worlds that go around them, and the identities that go around them. And you begin to realize even these states of concentration are, are fabricated. That's one of the reasons you don't want to do this kind of analysis too early, because early on in the process it, they are obviously fabricated. But as you get more and more used to them, they become more and more just part of the way the mind is. And you tend to forget what went into creating the mind that way. You feel that you've come down to a deeper level of reality inside the mind, which you have. But you have to see, well, this too is fabricated. And as I said, one way of doing this is noticing the mind as it's in a state of concentration. The other is as it moves from one level of concentration to another, you begin to realize you drop certain things. There are fewer and fewer elements that go into each of the progressively higher stages of concentration. And you can see them fall away as you go from a lower level of concentration to a higher one. You see, oh, this is part of that construction, part of that fabrication. And when you begin to see that this too is not as solid and as reliable as you thought it was. That's when you look for something even better. And it's in looking for the something better that you find that there is a state in the mind that does not need to be fed. It's a dimension. And that's where all the conflict ends. So we realize that the good fight is not outside, the good fight is inside, overcoming the, the hungers you have, the greed, the aversion, and the delusion that create the identities and the worlds in which you have to struggle with others or struggle with yourself. So at the very least, even though other people may be fighting, you don't have to fight with them. And you've also got something that they can't touch. In other words, their fight cannot destroy. One of our problems of living in this world is if some idiot decides to declare war, we're all in, suddenly get implicated. We're all put into danger. As long as we're identifying with things that other people can touch, other people can harm. So the only real safety lies in finding something inside that nobody else can touch. That's the good part of this, is it offers true safety. It's not just saying, well, I'm going to be passive and just kind of give in, let other people trample all over me. That's not victory. Victory lies in going inside and seeing, how did you place yourself in this position of danger to begin with? How can you get yourself out? And you realize you got in there because of your own greed, aversion, and delusion. Those are the things you've got to fight. But you fight using skill. And basically what you do is you convert the mind into a mind that doesn't want the greed, aversion, and delusion anymore. It's got a higher hunger and you've got something to satisfy that hunger. That's how you come out winning.